This episode is supported by Monster Joysticks. Level up your Raspberry Pi with their all-in-one arcade stick with genuine Sanwa arcade parts. The good old ZX Spectrum. That was a cheap and cheerful microcomputer indeed. Doesn't it make you feel warm and fuzzy? Its go-to format for programs, of course, was the cassette tape. A tangible and honest format if ever there was one. Well, more tangible than the holes in a punch card anyway. But we did pay a price for them, and that of course was our time. Tapes were slow of course, and we looked on in awe at our wealthier friends with their sexy floppy disks. For just look at that beauty. And it was this lack of a rapid storage solution for the ZX Spectrum, which meant it was overlooked at times for those more serious applications. Sinclair, makers of the Spectrum, did release their own microdrive and ZX interface to address this, but today's curiosity was a third party's offering to try and find that performance and price balance for the Spectrum crowd. This is the Rotronics Wafer Drive, or WAFA Drive if you want to give it a Python-esque spin, and it was released in 1984 at the price of £49.95 or around $65. US The Wafer Drive is sold as a fast access storage system, using special magnetic drive tapes, and it can locate programs to load automatically rather than you having to use your old-fashioned fingers to press buttons and rewind or fast-forward a cassette. What you may also recognise it as is a stringy floppy. That's a continuous tape loop device, and we'll find out more when we look at the tape itself, or the wafer as it's correctly called. Cosmetically, its injection moulded ABS plastic matches that of the ZX Spectrum. And while large in comparison to the Spectrum, it has nothing on the Commodore 64's 1541 or the Amstrad's FD1 drive. The 3 inch drive in the Amstrad, incidentally, was also fitted to later Spectrum models. Not one but two drives are installed, making wafer to wafer copy in a breeze, and there's some LEDs on the front there to indicate power and activity. The 35-way ribbon cable connects the drive up to the Spectrum, and then we're ready to go. And if you have other peripherals dependent on the same ports, it provides additional ports on the rear of the wafer drive for printers, modems, etc. So I guess what we should do now is plug it in and see what happens. Well, at first glance, really not very much indeed. It's booted quite normally, and that's because we first need to initialize the drive. To do that, we use the new asterisk command, typed on the terrible spongy keys of the Speccy. And as soon as we press enter, the wafer drive operating system, or WOS, kicks into life from an onboard 8KB ROM. And we've got version 1.80 here. What it's done is it's reserved about 2K of the Spectrum's 48K of memory to hold system variables, a read-write buffer, and various other overheads for its operation. It doesn't occupy a full 8 kilobytes of the Spectrum's memory because it functions by paging out. That is to say, it intercepts errors from the basic interpreter. So if you type in a command like new asterisk, which the Spectrum doesn't understand, the wafer operating system intercepts the error, interprets the command, and acts upon it. It's a nice memory-saving approach. Let's pop a wafer into drive A. The two drives are referred to as A and B respectively, and then we can run the cat command, a catalog command to see exactly what's on the wafer. After a short time of whirring and flashing lights on the drive, and some familiar flashing borders on the screen, we can see that there's two programs on the wafer. One named JSWII, which is only 1K in size. I wonder what that could be and Tazword, a word processor which I believe was bundled with the drive originally. We can also see a file type, PRG for program, but it could also be data or machine code types, and the size of each file in kilobytes. The size of the wafer and the free space are also shown along the bottom row. So, the next thing we're likely to want to do is to load a program, and we do that with, unsurprisingly, the load command. Again, the command is suffixed with an asterisk to differentiate it from the regular basic commands to load, for example, from a cassette tape. And here is where we ran into a problem. Bad sectors, the scourge of any storage format. While our wafer's catalogue can be read, the program data itself, even after cleaning the drive, which seems to be working fine, is just unreadable. I think we've got a dead wafer here. So the only thing to do is to open it up and look inside. Here's a wafer. The wafers have a capacity of 16, 64 or 128K. Size-wise it's as thick as a regular cassette, but all other dimensions are much smaller. 
The tape inside is 1.8mm in width, which is about twice the width of Sinclair's microdrive media, and is protected by a cover unlike Sinclair's offering. The length of the tape varies according to its capacity, but so too does the access time because the longer the tape, the more tape has to be wound to get to your data. On the left side is the right protection tab, which commonly, and in this case, gets snapped off, hence the masking tape. Now I know a non-working wafer with a missing protection tab isn't the best example I could show you, but it's all I've got. But the advantage is it does mean I don't feel bad about cracking it open to look inside. Now as I said, access times vary according to the tape size. The wafer drive performs the seek at a high speed setting before reading the data at a lower speed setting. On average, it operates at around 2 kilobytes per second once the seek is completed, but that seek can take up to 45 seconds on a 128k cartridge, which is reduced to 6.5 seconds on the smaller 16k cartridge. Either way, in comparison to a cassette tape, it's still very quick, but it is slower than floppy disk technologies of the time. Inside it's pretty simple, which of course keeps it cheap. There's one continuous loop of tape on the central wheel, which is fed up to the read-write head of the wafer drive at the top. Let's pull all of that tape out, because I want to show you a key part of it. The correct disposal method of tape, as I'm sure you'll all agree, is from the window of a moving car, and I'll be sure to stick to that protocol. If we look very carefully here, we can see the tape join, which makes it continuous. This is a conductive splice with a metallic leader tape, which the drive can detect, and it's just after the join in the tape here where the index marker sits on the first usable sector. This holds the index of what's on the tape, which is what our cat command located and displayed. To speed things up, the catalogue is held in RAM after first being read, and subsequently the drive only checks to see if the tape has been changed before listing the wafer contents when requested, so that can save up to 45 seconds of seek time. But alas, the catalogue is all we'll be reading today, until at least I can locate some more working wafers. So what became of the wafer drive? Well, it didn't exactly take the computer world by storm, you may have never heard of it. It didn't suffer the same reliability issues as Sinclair's microdrive, because it had more tape to work with, and therefore there was less wear and tear, and there was also that protective cover. Although 34 years was pushing it too far on this occasion for our wafer to work. No, its demise was really down to the lack of support from software houses. While your favourite programs could be purchased on 5.25 inch floppies for your C64 or 3 inch floppies for your Amstrad CPC, wafer based programs were nowhere to be seen on our shop shelves. The same type of drive was manufactured by Birmingham Sound Reproducers, or BSR, and it was also used in a similar device called the Quick Data Drive for the Commodore 64 and VIC-20, where it met a similar fate. And so, the ZX Spectrum's wafer drive was consigned to the list of forgotten storage devices, and that's a very, very long list indeed, I can tell you. And that is today's bite-sized curiosity. As always, thank you for watching, and take care. If you enjoyed this video and you'd like to support future similar content, then why not join the list of people scrolling up the screen here on Patreon with a small donation to the cave. Thank you each and every one of you for your ongoing support.